for you do I'd like for you to turn your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 1 and the title of this message is Rising Above the Rubble. Now I have been in Nehemiah on several occasions and as I was getting ready to prepare uh, for this message I was praying asking God what he'd have me to bring uh, to you today. He began to lay this message on my heart and it's some familiar scripture to, to some of us. I'm going to read the first seven verses. Again, the title of the message is Rising Above the Rubble. It says in verse 1, it says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hachaliah, And it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came he and certain men of Judah, and asked them, and I asked them concerning the Jews, that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days, and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And I said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and deserve his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thy eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servant, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. So we come up here, we, we kind of, we see this guy named Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is cupbearer to the Persian king Artaxerxes. And as he's there, here he, he's a captive. Nehemiah is a captive. He's there and he's doing a very special job He's trusted by the king, but as he's there living in this foreign country, he receives news about his homeland, about the desolation and the rubble that has occurred in his homeland. So he, Nehemiah is basically told that your, your homeland, your city, the, the land that you love is in, is in rubble, is destroyed. And I, and I thought about this, and I thought about how, I, as I was reading this, how can I understand how Nehemiah must have felt? And how what I help you understand how he feels, because it says there that he, that he wept and mourned about the situation. I remember how I felt on 9-11. I, I remember as I was coming back from somewhere, and I remember stopping at my parents' house, and I remember... I didn't know what was going on. I walked in to watch all that take place live. And, and, I'm, and I remember how I felt. I remember as, just to be real and honest, as I watched people jump out of buildings and, and I saw it crumble. And I thought that must have been how he felt about all that was going on in his homeland. So that gives us an idea because, you know, we read these things and sometimes we don't really get an understanding about how they're feeling about a situation. So as I was looking at it, I thought about us and I thought about just like Nehemiah, sometimes we deal with terrible news. Sometimes we get news and we get bad news. We get terrible news. And sometimes we face rubble in our lives, just to put it in a in a personal box, just to put it personally for you today and for me, sometimes we we deal with the rubble of family problems. Sometimes there's things that that happen in our families, things that that go on in our family, and and we had this loving family at one time, 
but then something happens and now it's just in shambles. It's it's crushed down and, and it's and it's in rubble now. And we look at that and we think about that and, and that's devastating to the the core of our family. And when we might even make a, a statement like this, man, it'll never be like it used to be. But then sometimes we deal with the rubble of, of financial problems. I think we've all sitting here, most of us, have probably dealt with some kind of thing that's happened where we didn't have as much money that we needed to pay for something that happened that we had no control of. And we had to make arrangements to deal with something. And I know that sometimes you like to lay down and say, man, I got all this under control. But then all of a sudden, this thing hits. And I'm in bad shape now. But then sometimes there's the rubble of our own failures. You know, I can look back over my life and, and I can look at things and I can see where the, I've done some things and it was me. I was the one that caused the problem in my own life or something that caused devastation or something in someone else's life. And I look at that or in, 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 in the situation and I don't like and I hate to admit that, but there's sometimes we as individuals, we deal there's some things that, that we have done that's happened. And so we all face these certain questions. And I got a question here. It says, uh, what do you do when the, you encounter the brokenness of your own life? I mean, this message today is going to tell us what Nehemiah did and how he handled the situation in his life. And I thank God for it because I need to know how to handle situations that come along. But I begin to look at this and I notice that there's some ways that we respond to rubble. And see, sometimes we respond to rubble in like four or five different ways. And sometimes we respond by getting better. And it's easy to get better because it's always easy to have this thought. Whenever something's going wrong in your life, to look at somebody else's life and say, how do they have it so good? What did they do? They don't deserve that. Why is this happening to me? And sometimes we get better. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 12, 15. It says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So what that verse is telling us is somebody, if we allow things to get control of us and allow bitterness to take root in our life. It grows up. And guess what it does? It consumes our life. And what happens then when that bitterness has consumed our life, everybody we come in contact with is going to get smacked with the branches of our bitterness. You've met people that way. I have met them. I may have been that way where I was bitter and everybody I come in contact with, I tainted them. Or I was tainted by somebody else's bitterness. So I can allow bitterness to mess up my life. Because just do what the last part of the verse says. It says, and thereby many be defiled. So if you allow the rubble of your life to make you better, then I'm telling you what, it's going to destroy your life and those around you. Another way we do this is, is that sometimes we respond to, to rubble by living a beaten life. What I mean by that is this, is that we have the attitude, it's already, I'm beaten, there's no use to even try. It's, it's, it's like this all way. Every, every cloud has a tornado in it. Everything's wrong. Everything's bad. And sometimes we just live a beaten life. I'm going to tell you something. Satan loves to have you living a beaten life. Because see, if he can get you to the point where you're allowing the things that's happening in your life to beat you down and you live that beaten life, 
what happens is, is you're never going to be effective for God and what Satan will do. Everybody look at me. This is so important. Everybody look, 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 look. What he'll do is this. He'll have somebody that you love look at your life and say this. If they are giving up, what hope do I have? Because somebody is looking at my life and somebody is looking at your life. If I allow myself to be beaten down and just live a beaten life, then everybody around me, especially those ones that may look up to me, would say, well, if they can't handle it, how can I? And then Satan loves to get you to that point. And then sometimes we respond to bad news and trouble and rubble by living a life of bondage. I've done this, I looked at this years ago. And you know how they catch monkeys? What they do is this, y'all don't know, I'm going to tell you. That's how they catch it. They get a jar or a coconut or something and they'll fasten it to a tree or to a post. And they'll cut just enough hole in our jar. And they'll cut just enough so if a monkey sticks his hand in and he grabs whatever fruit or treat they have, he'll grab his fist like this right here. And so when he tries to get away, guess what? He can't get out. But see, all he has to do is just let go. Even when he sees the men or the ladies coming to capture him, He's sitting there and he's pulling, but he can't get it. But all he would have to do is just do this and let go. And guess what? He'd be free and he could run on living his monkey life. Okay? But what happens is, that's what happens to us. See, some of us have had things happen in our life and that we're holding on to it and we're holding on to this thing and instead of letting it go and allowing God to heal us and to bring victory in our life, we're holding on to it and it is destroying our life. Listen to what God says in 1 Peter 5, 7. It says, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. So God is telling you to cast your rubble, your burdens, your life, cast it on him. And he'll take care of it because he loves you. Because he cares for you. But as long as I hold on to it, I'm going to live a life of bondage. And so it really comes on this. My future or your future depends on this. Christian, for anybody listening, as long as I hold on to the past and the pain and all those things in the back, I'll never be able to move forward in my life. It'll always keep me in bondage. And I know when I preach this, I know there's always somebody that says, well, you don't understand what I've went through. And I don't. I'm not going to ever stand up here and say I understand everything because I don't. But I do know this. If you'll cast it on the Lord and turn it loose, because when you cast something, guess what? You gotta let it go. I've never been ever fishing and saw a fisherman go like this and hold on to it. You know why? Because they're not catching anything. What do they do? They let it go, then they what? Then they have success or victory. And then sometimes people, and we'll get to the how to respond how the other part, the good part here in this minute. But another thing is that sometimes we respond to rubble by blaming others. Sometimes we respond to rubble in our life by blaming others. I'm here to tell you, and I do understand, sometimes it is another person's fault. Sometimes somebody else done something and sometimes it was them. They done it. It was them. They were wrong. They, they were evil. It, it was them. It was them. It was them. It was them. But as long as I allow them to keep controlling my life by not giving it to the Lord, I'm going to struggle 
in my life. And I'm going to live a life of no joy. Because see, they're still controlling my life if I allow them to. So I've got to turn loose up. I've got to stop blaming others. And sometimes, like I said earlier, I've got to look in the mirror. And it's one of the hardest persons in the world it is to forgive is guess who? Is myself. Sometimes you need to forgive yourself. Ask God to forgive you. Let me say something to you. If God will forgive you, why can't you forgive yourself? Amen? So how does Nehemiah go about this? I mean, what does he do? I mean, how does he rise above the rubble of his life? What does he do? We see this in verse 4. four we see that he gets real with God. Look what it says. It says, And it came to pass when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed, look at there, before the God of heaven. So ne Nehemiah's immediate response to the rubble that he heard, the news he heard, was to get on his knees before the Lord. And when he talks about fasting, it means he got serious about what was happening in his life. See, he got serious, he got real about what was going on. It wasn't the prayer of generalities. He didn't just cover anything up. He, was, he wasn't faking about anything. He was real to the Lord about what was going on in his life. He was real about the situation. So if I bring what is going on to my life, I've got to bring it to the Lord and be honest about it. I've got to be real about it. As long as I make excuses about something, I'll never get victory over it. I've got to be real to the Lord. Listen to what it says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And actually, that verse has been rolling today. It says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. So listen to what it says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not to your understanding. So what it says, Give it to the Lord. And be real about whatever's going on in your life. And the next thing I've seen about this is in verse 5. Is that Nehemiah begins to remember who he's praying to. Listen to what he says. He says, And said, I beseech thee. This is verse 5 again. And said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and deserve his commandments. So look what he prays. He prays, O, God, o Lord God of heaven. So he's talking about the superiority of God. He says, Oh, Lord God of heaven, there's nobody like God. There's nobody like God. And God is the only one that can deal and help you in the situations that you have in your life. So he's praying, oh, Lord God of heaven. And then he goes, as he says, that God of heaven, he's talking about the strength of God. So he is proclaiming God or God is the creator. So he's remembering who he's dealing with. When he gets down to pray, it's not just a I lay me down to sleep prayer. It is a prayer of recognizing God as a superior one. He's recognizing God's strength in his life. Then he says, God of heaven. Then he's recognizing the sovereignty of God, that God is the ruler. So when you get down and pray about whatever it is in your life, you're remembering that God is superior, that God has strength to deal with whatever it is in your life. That God is king. Jesus is king of kings and Lord of lords. There's nothing in your life that God can't deal with. And then he says the great and terrible God. So he talks about the sacred, sacredness of God. I use King James Version. It uses the word terrible. The word means awesome. So when you're praying, you are praying to the awesome God of heaven. And see, I'm telling you all of this, and he's reminding himself of all this as he prays to remind him that no matter how bad the news is, no matter how bad everything looks, I'm praying to an awesome God. And then he says, that keepeth covenant and mercy, and that is the sincerity of God. God keeps his promise. And so the Bible says this, if I cast, tells me to cast all my stuff upon him because he cares for me. And so knowing that he cares for me, I'm surely 
going to cast my troubles upon him. And so as you look at this, when you carry your rubble to the Lord, you got to remember that God loves you. That God cares about you. In Ephesians 3.20 it says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh within us. So when I get down to pray, he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that I ask or think. See, somebody walked in here today, somebody's listening online today that is dealing with some things in their life. And they need to be real about this situation. And they need to remember who they're praying to. They're praying to an awesome God. Remember how God has worked out things in your past. And look and know that God will work out things in your future. Amen. And then the next thing is just right here. And this is very important. Nehemiah realigns himself with the Lord. Notice what he says in verse 6 and 7. He says, let thine, let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now day and night. So this ain't just a one-time thing. He's serious about what's going on. Then he says, for the children of Israel, thy servant, listen to what he says, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. So he's being real. He says, God, if I'm, 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 I'm at fault here, God, I'm confessing it. Then he says in verse 7, we have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. So we find Nehemiah realigning himself so realigning yourself would be somewhat like renewing yourself or coming to God. And how you do that, how you realign yourself with the Lord is that you confess anything in your life that's wrong and you follow what God says about every situation in your life. So you get real and you remember who you're dealing with and you realign the things in your life. And maybe this morning, you need to realign or rededicate yourself to the Lord. Second Chronicles 7, 14, very well-known verse. But listen to what it says. Maybe you need to do this this morning. If my people... Now, I want to tell you something. This is talking to people of God would be a Christian today. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So if I will realign myself with the Lord and get right with him, God will work in my life and heal the things in my life. So here's the thing. So let's do this right here as we give the invitation. Examine your own life and the rubble that's in your life right now. Now listen to what I'm saying. I, I don't want you to be thinking about everybody else. I want you to think about your life and what's going on in your life. If your marriage right now is struggling and there's things in your marriage right now that you need help with, then surely come up and let's pray about it and give it to the Lord. Because see, somebody probably needs some rebuilding. Some people need some restoration. Some people need some reconciliation. So if there's something in your life right now, if your marriage is struggling, then come forward and let's pray about it. If you're struggling in your walk with the Lord, come up and let's pray about it. If you've got bad news and you're struggling with whatever it is, come forward and we'll pray about it. We'll get real about it. We know who we're talking to. And we'll get real line and we'll allow the Lord to work in each and every situation of our life. Here's the thing. Nehemiah got real. 
But that's the thing. Will you be real? Will you be real about what's going on in your life? 